The story of David and Goliath is more than just a cute little children's Bible story. It's not a fairy tale made up by some Sunday school teacher. It's a real story of a real battle with a real giant. It is the story of how we can have victory over the spiritual giants in our lives, which look impossible to defeat. But it's deeper than that. There's more to it. It was a fight for spiritual supremacy on planet Earth. There was more at stake here than one realizes. For David would be the one through whom the Messiah would come. And he has no posterity as of yet. Therefore, Satan would use this giant in an attempt to destroy the plan of God. If he kills David, think of this. If he kills David, he prevents the Messiah. Jesus Christ, David's great, 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 whatever, grandson from being born in Bethlehem's manger. If he can prevent the birth of Jesus Christ, he can prevent the cross. If he can prevent the cross, he can prevent your salvation. If he prevents your salvation, there's no dream of heaven, no hope of salvation, and no freedom from sin. If, if he can do that, he will hold you and me as prisoners on planet Earth. But thank God our heavenly David defeated Satan, the greatest Goliath of them all 2,000 years ago, and totally and completely he did so at the cross. Revelation 5 verse 5 says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed. And indeed he has. Amen. So this story has great spiritual implications. It was a monumental battle. And we can learn some valuable lessons for our spiritual life here. In the story, the Philistines stood on one hillside while Israel stood on the other with a valley between them. The valley was a typical dry wash or wadi uh, filled with a rushing torrent during the, the, the winter rains, but then it would be dry the rest of the year. Neither the Philistines nor the Israelites were about to go down the hill and then have to fight the other on an uphill slope. Wouldn't be real smart. So they do what was quite common in ancient warfare. They decide on a representative conflict. Instead of the two armies fighting, uh, each army chooses a champion to fight. And when I, when I think of that, I can't help but to think about God choosing Jesus Christ to fight our battle at the cross. The outcome of their battle determines which army wins the victory and which one takes over the territory in question. The Philistines had what they thought was an ace in the hole. Goliath of Goth. Goliath, Goliath was a giant. And in those days... There, were, there, were, there was a whole civilization of giants in the Jordan Valley. It's a historic fact that hundreds of skeletons of giant people have been found in that valley. Goliath was huge. <laughs> he stood somewhere uh, between, it, depending on, on, on the reckoning of the cubit, but he was somewhere between nine and a half and ten and a half feet tall. He would have been a surefire, no doubt, number one first pick in the NBA draft. But Calipari would have got him at Kentucky before that happened for one year. You can only imagine how imposing he must have been. And it wasn't just his size that was quite imposing, but he wore a coat of mail, which was, uh, uh, had metal plates that weighed at least 125 pounds, but may have weighed more. His armor itself probably, most likely, weighed more than David. As well, Goliath wore a bronze helmet and, a, and, and, and bronze leggings uh, to protect his shins. He carried a bronze javelin or spe spear slung between his so soldier, or shoulders, and the head of his spear alone weighed, the Bible, 600 shekels of iron, or about 20, 25 pounds. And then on top of it, verse 7 says something. 
I'd, I'd not seen before nor paid attention, I, I guess. He had a shield carrier who walked before him. The Hebrew word refers to the largest kind of shield. It's the size of a full man designed to protect the body from the arrows of the enemy. So in addition to his body armor, Goliath had a, a fellow running in front of him carrying a man-sized uh, shield for double protection. <laughs> imagine, imagine this imposing sight. Clearly the odds would be stacked against whoever fought this giant. In verse 8, the giant will cry out, Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. Mano a mano, hand-to-hand -hand combat, one-on-one. -on -one. Goliath says, let's fight. No need to send your whole army. Just send a fighter to fight against me. And Goliath didn't just issue this challenge one time, but he repeatedly challenged Israel 40 days every morning and, and every evening. He marched out, flaunting his size, right, flexing his muscles. He, he's, 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 he's flaunting and daring anyone to come and fight him. Kind of sounds like the spiritual giants we face. Can you say amen? I mean, they come back every day. And they are relentless in their endeavor to intimidate us. The giants I'm speaking of could be a person, a pressure, a sin, an addiction, a worry, uh, a fear that badgers us every single day, yelling across the ravine in your own personal valley, relentless, scary. And to face them in our own strength is just an impossibility. And then verse 11 says, can I tell you the situation here? It says, when, when Saul and all of Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now consider Saul, he's the king. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people of Israel. So he's, he's like the biggest guy Israel has. Not compared to the giant, he may not have been too big, but he was the biggest they had, and he's their king, he's their leader, and he's afraid. Now, it's quite a contrast when you, when you, when you go back and you read as, as when he first became king, he's, you know, he, he's got all this boldness. When the Spirit of the Lord had come upon him, he, 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 he was ready to fight, he did fight, but now the Spirit of God has departed, and he is a coward. And can I tell you something that's very important to understand that without the Spirit of the Lord, you will become a spiritual coward. I don't care how big you are. <laughs> and you'll become a spiritual coward without the Spirit of the Lord. The early church had a boldness and a courage to go against the persecution they faced because they were filled with the Spirit. So without it, we are spiritual wimps. But Saul wasn't the only one who wasn't volunteering. There was his son Jonathan, a good man. He, he, he uh, assisted by only his armor bearer. You can read about this in chapter 14. He, he had slain 20 Philistines. But this good man doesn't step to the plate. And then there was Abner, the captain of the host, a valiant man, the Bible calls him. But he too declined Goliath's challenge. Now listen to me. My friend, the best and the bravest of men are no more than what God makes them to be. And without the Spirit of the Lord, the bravest of hearts become cowards. You may be bold in your flesh, but my friend, when it comes to spiritual things, you'll become a coward real quick. No one stepped forward, not Saul, not Jonathan, not Abner. No one from Israel, that is, until David, God's champion, comes on the scene. I want you to consider David. We've considered Goliath. We've considered Saul. But let's consider David. Hardly anyone knows about David. He's just probably now 17 years old. He comes from the shepherd field, away from everything in a place of solitude he's been. He, he's been writing psalms. He's been spending time alone with God. He's been worshiping, learning faith and how God delivers. He's been practicing with his sling and he's been killing lions and bears. David comes from the place of communion. He's 
full of faith and courage. It was in the shepherd fields that God taught him uh, uh, of, of the wonderful resources available through faith. It was in the solitude of the fields that he learned how God delivers. Uh, and I can assure you that David would have never been able to face Goliath in public had he not faced the lion and bear in private. Listen, folks, we need a private relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, which will lead to a public ministry. David could not kill the public Goliath until he had slain the lion and bear in secret. Come on now. Here's the first lesson from a giant killer. If we have no private communion with God, we will have no public courage to face the giants. The prayer closet, the place of communion, time alone with God is that great battlefield of faith. It is the place of denying self, a place of daily taking up our cross. It is the place where we come forth in the presence and the power of God with courage and direction and victory. It all starts in the battlefield of prayer. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Listen, listen to the psalmist in Psalm 91 verse 1. It says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And then look at verse 2. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. Where does this man get such confidence and trust? The secret place. The place of prayer and communion. So we learn that this is the key to facing our giants, spending time with God. Amen. David, David was home in, in Bethlehem keeping his father's sheep, minding his own business. Too young to be in, the, in Saul's army. Too young. He had three older brothers that were fighting in the army. So his father, Jesse, out of concern for those three sons, sends David on an errand to bring them some food and to check on them. He wants to see how they're doing. And when he arrives on the scene, he, he sees this giant, Goliath, and he's defying the armies of God. Verse 24 says, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, Goliath, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? I want you to pay attention to that. Have you seen this man that has come up? Notice Goliath's position now. When he first issued the challenge, he stood and he shouted out to the ranks of Israel. In verse 8, he said, let him come down to me. So he's in the valley. He's speaking to them up on the hillside. And he said, come down. But now the men of Israel say in verse 25, have you seen this man who has come up? Goliath has now crossed the ravine at the base of the hill and is coming up on the Israel side. And there's an important lesson here. You see, if you tolerate Goliath soon, he will take over your territory. He will move into your camp and he will take over your spiritual life. The giants of such things as addictions and greed and lust and pornography and jealousy and bitterness and on and on we could go will eventually take over your life. This is why we cannot afford to tolerate giants. We must kill them. Amen. This is the second lesson. Kill the giant or he'll kill you. Come on. Amen. Kill that giant. Or he's going to kill you. When David sees what's going on, he's grieved. He's grieved. And he, and he says in verse 26, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who is this heathen? Nobody has talked about God. But David starts talking about God. And he says, nobody is going to talk about my God like that. Why are you, what are you all running for? Why are you afraid? You see, the others were focused on the giant, and David was focused on the honor of God. 
Oh, that's a great lesson, isn't it? You know, when the men of Israel said this, they, they, when they said this man, David said, this uncircumcised Philistine. When the men of Israel said, surely he has come up to defy Israel, David said that he should defy the armies of the living God. When the men of Israel said the man who kills him, David said the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel. David saw things from the Lord's perspective, but the men of Israel saw things only from man's perspective. And I want to tell you, if you're going to be a giant killer, you got to see things from God's perspective. No one else mentions God. The soldiers say nothing of God. His brothers say nothing of God. Saul says nothing. But David steps on the scene fresh from the shepherd's field and he raises the subject of the living God. Who is this heathen defying the armies of God? And then he does the same thing when he sees Saul. When, when Saul uh, tells him, you, you can't help to defeat this Goliath. Here's what David said in verse 37. The Lord, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Oh, yeah, David is bringing up God. He continues the theme when he meets Goliath, and the giant mocks him. Listen to what he says in verse 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, with a spear, and a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, unto the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know what? That there is a God in Israel. He's focused on God. Huh. And then verse 47, and his, this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth. Not with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Six times David brings up God to Goliath. No one else speaks of God, but David discussing, discusses nothing but God. The people have majored in Goliath. David majors in God. David faces Goliath unintimidated because his focus is on his God. Listen, intimidation is the great weapon of our enemy. Giants, how many of you know they intimidate? They intimidate. We get tongue-tied, confused. We forget how to pray. We focus on the odds against us. We forget whom we represent. We stand there with knees knocking. But not David. His eyes were not on the giant, but rather on his God. How often we see the problem instead of the problem solver. We see the mountain instead of the mountain mover. We see the sin instead of the Savior. We see the sickness instead of the healer. Israel saw nothing but the giant, but David saw the giant killer. Here's another important lesson. If we face giants, we must focus on God. <laughs> and David says in verse 29... Is there not a cause? He has a passionate concern for God's cause. He's full of faith. Look at verse 45 again. He said, I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Well, this is a, this is a powerful verse. The, the, the Lord of hosts is, in the Hebrew, it's Jehovah Sabah. It means this, that which goes forth Organized for war, an army, a, a host. This refers to the heavenly armies of, of, of God. David understood something. Notice the plural armies. The armies. The common observer only sees one army of Israel, but not David. He sees the allies. <laughs> he sees the platoon of angels. He sees the weapons of nature. David knew God could rain hell down as he did for Joshua or stir the thunder as he did for Samuel. Let me tell you something. Right now, the host of heavenly beings are riding through the heavenlies on our behalf, waiting to receive their next assignment to fight for us. They are stationed all over the world, a troop here and a troop there. They are the unseen forces of heaven ready to fight our giants. And I can hear some of you saying, I don't believe that. Raise your hand. if you, No, don't raise your hand. I don't believe it. 
I don't believe that's how it is. That's why you don't have the courage to face giants. Because you don't believe that. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't face a giant either. Elisha's servant didn't believe. Elisha, did he? Remember, Elisha prayed for him. I mean, they, they, they've come, they, this is, the army comes to get this one man, Elisha. And he, I mean, the, the servant's falling apart. What are we going to do? And Elisha said, hey, they that are with us are more than they that are with them. And the servant said, what are you, what are you talking about? And, the, and it says in verse 17, here's what Elisha prays. Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mount was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Oh, the heavenly host was there. You, you, you may not see it, but they are there. They are there, and David knew it. And David said in verse 47, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Wow. What, how powerful that is. I, if you will remember that the battle is the Lord's, victory is on the way. When God is on your side, there's not enough devils in hell to defeat you. If you're fighting with the understanding, and here's the key, understanding that within yourself you're no match for Goliath, but Goliath is no match for your God, then victory is soon coming. The moment you say that and believe it, Angels will leave the balconies of glory to come to your rescue. So the fourth lesson of a giant killer is the battle is the Lord's. This is good, right? Good lessons we, we're learning here if we'll apply them. Lesson num number six. Now, wait a minute. Let me, make, let me make another point before we get to that lesson. Let me, let me make a point here, okay? Some people say... I don't need to do anything because the battle is the Lord's. I have no part to play. Okay, sirrah, sirrah. Whatever will be, will be. I don't need to fight. They're in the B Company. You know what the B Company is? The B Company is this. They will be here when you leave, and they'll be here when you come back. A lot of people in the B Company, Hear me, God did not find five smooth stones, David did. God did not load the slingshot, David did. God didn't wind it up and sling it, David did. God didn't cut off Goliath's head, David did. God didn't sit on the throne of Israel, David did. God uses men and women to accomplish his, his will and his purpose on this earth. Men and women to preach, to pray, to witness, to give, to sing, to serve. He said to Abraham, build a nation. He did. He said to Noah, build an ark. And he did. To Mary, I want you to give birth to the Son of God. And she did. You are the hands and the feet and the voice of God. You are the warriors of God. When God gets ready to do something, guess what? He sends you. And you, and you, and you, and me. Of course, we have the full support, thank God, of the armies of heaven. But we must act. Amen. Amen. The fifth lesson of a giant killer is God will deliver through human instrumentality. Through human instruments, vessels. Lesson number six now. <laughs> if you think that being a giant killer... Doing great things for God will make you popular. You're sadly mistaken. When David came with the, with the provision, you would think Eliab would be all excited, but he, he, his eldest brother taunted and criticized David. He, I think he was still smarting over the fact that he wasn't the one anointed to be king. He was the firstborn. He looks at David. He says, I know your pride. And you think, what? What pride are you? What are you? As soon as David was anointed king, he went back to caring for the sheep. He didn't have himself fitted at Skeffington's for a robe. He didn't go buy a Ford chariot and parade around saying that I'm the man, I'm the chosen one. Y'all need to just worship me. You, I'm the man. No, he went back to taking care of the sheep, <laughs> which is why he was anointed in the first place. 
Because he was on divine assignment. That's where God had him. He obeys his father to bring food to his, to his brothers. He did that which was good, and yet he was still criticized. And then Saul tried to discourage him, telling him, thou art not able. You can't do this. You need to put on, my, put on this armor, do something. You, you're not able to do this. They said, I can't use that. It's not what David used when he killed the bear and the lion. He ain't going to try to use that stuff now. But, in fact, he, he, Goliath looked at him and, and, and despised him and mocked him. Of course, the enemy will do that. But true faith looks away from the words of men and says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Can, <laughs> who can be against us if God's for us? Verse 48, it says this. Even after being discouraged, even after being criticized, it came to pass when the Philistines arose and came and drew nigh to meet David. This is just, this is great. <laughs> that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. <laughs> While everybody else ran from Goliath, David ran toward Goliath. And no doubt David's brothers are like, oh my goodness, covering their eyes with fear and embarrassment. And Saul sighs as he figures, boy, he's a goner. Goliath laughs and mocks, but David seizes the moment. And with one swirl of the sling, the smooth stone hits its target and Goliath crumbles to the ground. Then David runs over, yanks out Goliath's sword and, uh, uh, from its sheath and he cuts off the giant's head. When's the last time you cut off a giant's head? Spiritually speaking. How long, how long has it been since you ran toward your giant? Ignoring him won't make him go away. Refusing to fight is a formula for, for, for defeat. Running away will get you killed. Do you ever notice there's no armor for the back side of a child of God simply because God never meant for you to run from the battle. He meant for us to face our giants. David ran toward his giant. How about you? Giant of divorce. You're not allowed in this house. Giant of lust. You're not conquering me. In the name of the Lord, I will overcome. Giant of fear, depression, insecurity. You must bow the knee at the name of Jesus Christ. Why? How can we say this? It's because David's greater son, his great, 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 however many grandson, Jesus Christ, has prevailed. The giant of sin was defeated 2,000 years ago, and we need to walk in that victory. So lesson number seven is run toward your giant. Face your giants. In closing, David says in verse 46, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. Pay attention to that. Into mine hand. And I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's. And notice this. And he will give you into our our hands. Notice the pronouns. Mine in verse 46. Mine hands. And then in verse uh, 47, he says, our hands. Mine hands. Our hands. You see, David was a type of Christ. He was Israel's mediator. As Jesus is ours. David won the victory for Israel. And hence he says, my hands, then our hands. 
He accomplished the victory for Israel, and his victory became the nation's victory. And likewise, Jesus has accomplished the victory for us at the cross, and now his victory has become our victory. Oh, that's good, isn't it? That's exactly how it is. Hence, we can say with Paul, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You know, you know what that means? I, 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 like, I, I want to try to illustrate like this. More than a conqueror. What, what's that mean? I mean, we read it, but that sounds good. What's it mean? Let me illustrate by saying two heavyweight boxers are fighting for the world championship. The winner will receive $100 million. The boxer who wins comes home and lays the $100 million check on the table and says to his wife, here you go, baby, it's yours. How many of you know he conquered, but she's more than a conqueror? And that's what Jesus did for us at the cross, defeating the greatest giant of all. At the cross, Jesus defeated sin, Satan, death, and now lesson number eight is his victory is our victory by faith. Isn't that wonderful? Perhaps you see a giant this morning across the valley. To be sure, it can be intimidating. It, it, it may be something at your job, school, lawsuit, a disaster, a sickness, a sin, a lust. Maybe your marriage. I don't know. I don't know what your giant is. I got my own. I don't know what your giant is. But God is saying to you right now, I think he's saying in this message to us all, get along with me until you're full of the Spirit, until you're full of courage, until you're full of faith. And then grab your sling, face your giant, and trust me, for my victory is your victory. My victory is yours. If you're here this morning and you are not saved, you can't save yourself. You have no hope within yourself against that giant of sin that will bring forth death and ultimately damnation in eternity you, you, you can't hope to overcome that but Jesus at the cross he paid your sin debt he arose from the dead he says now I am he who was dead but behold I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and hell and if you'll place your trust in him, his victory becomes your victory. You can be saved today and win over that giant of sin. And perhaps you're here and you're, you're a Christian, but you're struggling. There's a giant in your life. Sometimes Good people can get addicted to prescribed drugs. Sometimes they can get addicted to non-prescribed drugs. But can I tell you, there is no possible way that within yourself you can be victorious over that addiction. Do you know that it will just keep taking over more and more and more of your life until you would lie to, to your mother? You'd steal from your own mother because it 
controls your life. And you can go to every program they have out there. You can go to interventions. You can do all those things. But the only true victory is when you allow the victory of Christ at the cross to be your victory. Then you're truly free. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. It could be pornography. It may have started out with just a little a, a look. And then over time, it grows. And pretty soon, nobody else knows it. But you're on websites. Your wife doesn't know anything about it. Your children don't know anything about it. But you're bound. You're hooked. And that giant of lust and pornography has taken over more and more of your life until it's controlling you. Let me tell you, you don't have enough willpower to overcome that. But the blood of Jesus can. Well, I, I can name a lot of giants, giants of fear. Some of you live in torment constantly. Constant torment. It's worried, fearful of your children, fearful of what's going to happen, fearful you're going to die, fearful of this and that. Let me tell you, those are giants of fear that want to control your life. You can be free today. Learn some lessons from a giant killer. Mm. You can be free. When's the last time you cut off the head of that giant? I'm telling you today, you can cut the head of the giant off if you'll face your giant in the name of the Lord of hosts. He can and we'll be defeated in the name of Jesus. Amen. Don't let bitterness, that giant of bitterness, control your life and take over your life until it stains you until where everybody knows you're a miserable wretch. Let it go. Cut off the head of that giant today in the name of Jesus Christ. If you don't, it will continue to take over more and more of your life until it utterly destroys you. Face your giants.